don't theologize it away before we've had a chance to hear the pain and the hardship and the damage that was caused. You know, we need to stop doing the theology first. We need to live in the like in the pra- like what has actually happened. And a good not a good apology should acknowledge the power that is there and should also acknowledge the harm that is done and should be clear about the harm that is done. And that's it actually. I don't want you to ask for forgiveness. I don't want you to even particularly say sorry right now. Mm-hmm. You know? Because yeah, because, because actions we need to hear what like happened. You- Right. And and again, even if you really are sorry, you'll recognize a power imbalance of yeah. centering your own narrative. And like, it's literally yeah. just doing this as evidence that you don't, you're not really sorry because yeah. <laughs> you're doing more of the same. One of the ways that we've really uh, bolstered our own spiritual lives. So if we're not rooted and established, like we're not growing deeper, Uh, chances are we're not also growing wider. And even if we are growing in our expanse or in our reach, um, oftentimes it's not sustainable because the depth, our foundation isn't deep enough. So infinitum life is this grow deep, grow deep. Let your roots be uh, growing in and established firmly in the love of God. And so there's all kinds of things to help you do that. One thing we'd love to feature here is a course called The Creative Way Down. Uh, This is using the lens of the Beatitudes, so the core teachings of Jesus. It is intended to help us rediscover those core teachings of Jesus and lead us down, the creative way down. This is not about ascending. This is about deepening our lives. And the postures are surrender, generosity, and mission. Each of the um, course segments are in those three postures. They all take about a month to do. We do encourage you to do them together with some friends or at least one other friend and walk through this together. It will be sure to challenge you, to disrupt you, and to lead you downward into beautiful, beautiful depth where we can encounter God in new ways. So uh, Creative Way Down, you can find it on infinitumlife.com or you can find it on daniellestrickland.com. Either way, check it out and see if that course might be something that can reawaken your faith and root and establish you in love. Well, welcome to uh, the Right Side Up podcast. Hey, I got the name right. You did. And um, this Right Side Up season has been inspired uh, by like lamentable things. Uh, Basically, it's entitled, ah, all the things we can't live with about clergy sexual abuse. And it's out of our experiences. So you would have heard the introduction. This first um, uh, episode is on fake confession debunks. We need to do it. I keep waiting for someone to do this and nobody seems to be doing it. So it's time. I can't live with the fake confession anymore. I can't do it. We are debunking the fake confessions. Yes. It's not a fake confession debunk. That's uh... (laughs) right. We are debunking the fake confession. Thank you, editor. Also trigger warning. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. Uh, the reality is a lot of the themes and the conversations are going to be very triggering, especially with regards to uh, sexual abuse, which might not come as a surprise, but we do want to say it may take you a while to get through this. That's okay. You may want to take your time. You may want to listen to it with someone else. You may need to take a break for a while. That is okay. There is no wrong way here. Everyone processes these pieces. Everyone processes trauma differently. And so don't worry about the way that it affects you and if it affects you differently, that's okay. But take your time, look after yourself. Yeah. Thank you. And we have a guest. Hooray. Hello. Tell us all about Charlotte. Tell you all about Charlotte. This is a risky thing. I will say uh, (laughs) Dr. Naila Davis uh, is probably the person who has inspired me most uh, throughout my Christian walk. I like being nice to her because it makes her feel uncomfortable. I can feel it coming right. through. I also sometimes say nice things about Danielle here and she starts like shrinking. Just imagine yeah. that happening. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Introduce yourself. I, I'm i going to call you Charlotte all the time, even though she's Dr. Dr. Naylor doctor. Davis. Just yeah, doctor. Doc Should we call the you house. the doctor? The doctor's in the house. <laughs> yes. <Here's> the doctor. <laughs> Give us a moment about yourself, Charlotte. What would you like people to know? Uh, oh, I don't know. I hate doing these things. Um, Yeah. So I'm Charlotte and I you have known James a really long time and it's really hard to call him James because that isn't what I call him. And um, I 
have been in ministry for like 25 years ish. Um, about halfway through that, I went and did a PhD in biblical studies. Thought I was going to be a bit of an academic, um, but I got a chronic illness. So I have ME, um, which has severely changed my life. Um, and so now I'm back doing stuff with churches again. But yeah, I've been involved in various bits of activism all the time through those things. And I'm generally known as a bit of a feminist scholar. My churches tend to get used to me just going smash the patriarchy randomly yeah. <laughs> and things. So that's who you're getting. Um, yeah, it's been a long time coming, this this conversation. I'm really thankful for you for inviting me because I feel like we've been having these sorts of conversations at least the entirety of my ministry. So 25 years mm-hmm. underground. But I can't believe I'm still having these conversations at 44 when I encountered them when I was 18. So I'm like, it's too, it's too long. It's too long. Not enough has changed. So yeah, mm. and that's so you're you're part of that. Like things we can't live with anymore about this whole yeah. thing. I want to start with uh, one of the most infamous confessions, fake confessions, um, uh, and it's it's pretty intense. I'm gonna play the clip. So uh, so many people have seen this clip. Perhaps if you haven't seen this clip, be prepared. It's pretty intense, but it is a live confession of an Indiana um, pastor and it's uh, pastor John Lowe. I assume he's not a pastor anymore. So John Lowe. Um, And this is kind of what unfolds. Somebody caught it on camera and posted it to Facebook and it kind of just took off. I feel like there's some elements of this that help us begin this kind of like how confessions are used as a tool to harm and to minimize harm. So here we go. I committed the adultery. It was nearly 20 years ago. It continued far too long. It involved one person, and there's been no other, nor any other situation of unbecoming conduct conduct for the last 20 years. I will not use the Bible to defend, protect, and deflect my past sin. I have no defense. I committed the adultery. In accordance with our church bylaws, I'm stepping aside, stepping down from ministry responsibilities, and have committed to the Lord and now to you that I will submit to the process and recommendations of this board. If you love us, please let us talk. For 27 years, I lived in a prison. It was not 20 years. I lived in a prison of lies and shame. Lying to protect the Lowe family. For years I thought I was a horrible person having suicidal thoughts, not realizing what had been truly done to me. That I was a victim and I would still be in a prison if my brother, and many of you know him, Edgar Wolf, had not approached me just two weeks ago with what he had seen as a teenager that bothered him all these years. His pastor in bed with his younger sister, with t-shirt and underwear on, People knew but were too afraid to come forward, and they have now. The lies and the manipulation have to stop. I was a prisoner, and you kept me in your prison. I'm a prisoner no longer. I was just 16 when you took my virginity on your office floor. Do you remember that? Okay, that's a horrific clip, although the courage and fortitude and power of that you know, confrontation Mm. really. So we see the pastor does this big confession and then this couple, um, the victim and the survivor, the survivor Mm. and her husband step forward and take the microphone. And then if you keep watching this clip, you'll see them trying to get the microphone away from them and stuff, but she shares enough, um, that really just blows the whole confession up and reveals, um, what a fake confession is. Yeah. So there are elements of this. And so I just, I want to thank that survivor. Mm. I don't, I'm not in touch with her. I don't know yeah. who she is, but I just want to thank her because I feel like that expose was so powerful because that is exactly what every survivor would like to do. Uh, but doesn't have the, doesn't have yeah. the microphone, isn't given a microphone, isn't given a chance to. Um, but that is just such a, a, a really upfront, this is what this is like, here's the confession. And then here's the truth. And then how does yeah. that confession look in light of the truth? 
Yeah, it's remarkable, right? It's like she, you hardly ever see that as well. We hardly ever see the survivor and the perpetrator at the same time. And I think that's like, we're never faced with that. (laughs) We're always asked to look at one of them at a time. And actually, you're never asked to see them both together. And it makes the perpetrator look completely different. Yeah. And I guess like in my experience too, so that's the other thing we're just going to share. So if you're on video, um, if you're watching this on a video um, feed, I'm going to share the confession, the public confession that Bruxy Cavey from the meeting house um, put out. So this was like on Tuesday after the announcement of the investigation being finalized on this Sunday night. No, actually, I think it was before. Yeah, I think it was actually before. Um, I think it was too. I think he shared it before the town hall. Yeah. And so, and part of the idea, so when you, you, when you heard that other pastor from Indiana share his, um, you, sorry, this, oh, that worked and I stopped it. Sorry. Panicked. Um, you sort of go, it's, it sounds so, um, it sounds so definitive. And it sounds so humble and it sounds so honest and it sounds so like, oh, look at him. Like, so when you were just to hear him say, hey, I did something horrible 20 years ago and, you know, and it, 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 all of you are like, oh, wow, what a good guy, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's part of that fake confession sort of strategy is not only I'm the hero of this like story, but then also I'm the victim too. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's uh, Bruxy Cavey. So he talks about how he couldn't do this before and because of an official and external third party investigation. Um, so, and then he says, I've submitted to this process. That and does ignore the fact he did have five years before. To five. Conf- yeah, he had, there was eight. Oh, sorry. There were, there were many, many plus years. Plus 10, plus. <laughs> there were yeah. many years that he had an opportunity to confess and it wasn't yeah. until the victim came forward. So saying, Hey, I wanted to say something publicly, but I couldn't, but well, right. <laughs> you actually, actually had a lot of opportunities. And not only opportunity, yeah. but platform power yeah. microphones, you know, you um, you yeah, needed. you had a lot of opportunity. Mm. So yeah, there's debunk. Yeah. Number one is this is not your first opportunity to speak. No. Um, and, and that timing thing is really important because frequently people who are manipulating, they get out ahead of the narrative. Right. Mm. So he didn't wait for the church to, to process to work like he's saying he did. This kind of like, oh, I've submitted to the church process. No, you published this on your blog before the town hall meeting. So you mm-hmm. didn't. You got out ahead. You yeah. put your thing forward on your terms in a way that you could frame it before this happens. So there's a lie right there, right, of like I've submitted yeah. to the process yeah. and – you know, I'm a I'm a textual scholar, and that's mainly what I do is pull apart language. Submission, I want us to flag, because so many of these guys say they've submitted to something, and that is a good Christian value. So they're making us think they're doing a good Christian thing. It's deliberate language. It's not cap and stance, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And then at the core, so then the big sort of statement is this, at the core of these allegations... <laughs> there is truth. Some years ago, I had an extramarital affair. I'm ashamed even to write these words, and I'm so sorry that you have to read them. This adulterous relationship is my greatest failure, my darkest sin, and I take full responsibility for my actions. I have broken bonds of trust with my wife, family, and church family, including the woman I became involved with. I have brought untold pain, heartache, and confusion into the lives of those I love and who love me. I am deeply sorry. So it sounds good. Uh Right? Like upon first reading, you're like, oh, and then you see the responses on the blog are all like, Jesus forgives us. You know, like there are these, um, I mean, we can go on. Do you want me to go on and just read the whole confession? Yeah. So we read it and then. Okay. (laughs) I was also irresponsible in my role as a spiritual leader in Christian clergy, which involves dynamics of power and influence and an expectation of exemplary conduct that makes me doubly accountable. I accept this responsibility with deep regret for my actions. 
I wish I had had the courage years ago to divulge what has now become publicly known through the bravery of the woman I was involved with. Although I had repented before God, I kept it a secret from others. I am sorry upon sorry for my cowardice. I realize that repentance without confession is only partial and prevents healing and authentic relationship in the light of truth. Because I have so grievously failed in my responsibilities as a pastor, our church leadership has asked for my resignation and I have given it. (laughs) I am no longer a pastor at the meeting house. I am forever grateful to the meeting house and be in Christ Canada for giving me uh, this post. As you can imagine, my sin has caused devastating grief and pain in my family. It will likely take years to experience significant healing. Still, I think my wife and our daughters are amazingly wise, strong, and loving. I am doing the work of facing the damage I have caused. My family is walking this road alongside me, and the healing is beginning with the help of dear friends, psychotherapy, spiritual direction, and the prayers and encouragement of so many of you. Thank you. As for what's next in our lives, we just don't know. And we all appreciate your prayers now as we take a season to consider our next steps. Lastly, it goes without saying, but I will say it anyway. My failure is not a failure of the presence, power, or teaching of Jesus, but an example of the pain someone like me can cause when I ignore his presence and fail to follow his lead. So that's the confession, and it was posted on a blog. Um, it has never been talked about publicly. It's never been mentioned by the meeting house. It has never been debunked. Um, It has never really even gotten any visceral attacks or any kind of public uh, on the social media feed. It's vast majority is support. Mm -hmm. Um, What's been fascinating to me is that the victim's statement. uh, So the next day I read out the victim's statement with Gerard, uh, with Jared, and um, it was completely attacked <laughs> and the social media visceral, you know, picking apart and like victim shaming and blaming. And so I have, I've, I've not been able to live with this mm. uh, first that I just kept waiting for the church to debunk the blog yeah. based on the facts of the case. I just kept waiting because uh, you know, what he does here is he suggests there's some truth, but then he defines the truth. Yeah. as an extramarital affair, which we saw in the video is exactly what that guy did too, which is mm-hmm. again, getting ahead of the narrative and then making it a lesser charge. Yeah. Um, so this is what he says. It was an extramarital affair, which the first investigation decided it was not. And as subsequent, we didn't think they were strong enough in their language or even properly describing what had actually happened And then nine months later, they agreed and said, you're right. We did not use strong enough language. We did not describe what happened. But in so doing, this this confession kind of set the narrative for the church. And a lot of the harm and visceral comments and victim shaming and bullying and online harassment that happened is is a direct result of this blog Mm. and a lack of debunking it publicly by anybody. Um, and that's what I can't live with. I just kept waiting for somebody to do it that had position and power in that setting. Cause that's who should be doing this. Yeah. But yet again, there's nobody to do this. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. I will say yeah. when I was Googling to try and find this, all the articles that come up are ones of you talking about it in the first place. So I guess it's, it's you, Danielle, You're, yeah. <laughs> it's gotta be you. Yeah. I, I just, I find it so irritating though, because this kind of thing is so harmful to the victim and to survivors, because this is exactly what they know and what they assume and what they've learned will happen. They'll be vilified. They'll be, you know, the narrative will be set. And actually what's really interesting is Hagar told me this is what would happen from the beginning. And I said, no, 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 that can't, it's 2022. Like this can't like 2021 post me too. Well, yeah, like, like, that, yeah. That's yeah. Not a thing. like that, that's not going to happen. And then, then that was my resolve to say, well, no matter what happens, I'm, gonna be, you know, that's yeah. just, what's going to happen. I'm going to be with you, but yeah. So even this, this like defining, I'm going to define what this is, even though the initial investigation will also even say, this is not what this is. Yes. Yeah. And, and that means that, the moment somebody does that as publicly, like we know, <laughs> we're, I'm sure we're going to talk about power a lot, but 
he's got a much bigger following than the victim has, right? So loads of people hear this, and now it's her job to prove he's wrong. Right. So that's the other way that power works in this, is that the person generally, particularly in something like clergy sexual abuse, the person who has is the perpetrator has got a lot more power in every level of discussion that we have. And by defining it for himself as an extramarital affair, well, then his supporters are going, OK, prove him wrong. Right. And, and that means that the survivor has to give more and more of themselves make themselves more and more vulnerable because they've got to prove they're now playing catch up. So like, it's interesting for me that that paragraph comes before any talk about his power or being clergy or his position, you know, it's like, let me tell you about me. (laughs) Let me send to me here (laughs) just in case this was about somebody else. And we see that loads in confessions and fake confessions. I'll just say yeah. to myself. I mean, look, it's I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, 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 who yeah. is this about? Who is who this is about? about? Yeah, who's, this is about who's really, yeah. What's this story really about? Is it about a survivor? Is it about the, the crime that's been committed? No, it's about me. Right. <laughs> so let me tell you about me first. <laughs> also, so there's also a couple of things like this adulterous relationship is my greatest failure, my darkest sin. Mm-hmm. So this is pre three other investigations that were substantiated, including one with a minor. So again, if you're looking for falsity yep. in this paragraph, here's a good one. Is this really your deepest, darkest sin? Cause I would assume three more like it one with a minor might actually be as yeah. dark as this, if not darker. So again, yeah. it's like a narrative I'm going to put out there and I'm going to project, but actually is not really truthful. Yeah. So. And I'm, I'm going to focus you on one action that I did. So I'm not going to think about my character or who I've been or, or the wider context in which this happens. Let me focus you on one, one action I did, please. <laughs> I, I think so. Somebody... Sorry. <laughs> Sean That's right, and I always talk over each other, so there's nothing new here. Uh, I, I think one of the, and starting where he does, reveals where pastors have perhaps the most power, which is ultimately most people want to believe them. Mm-hmm. Like nearly everyone reading this blog ultimately wants to believe that it's not as bad as it could be. They want to believe that this person who has been so important, so impactful, Yo, know, is actually closer to Jesus and isn't as flawed as as perhaps they actually are. Mm-hmm. And I think that because we are frankly used to a lack of humility from people in power, and not just church leaders, everywhere, humility yeah. is not seen as a strength. So even the hint of humility or the offer of submission, we think is so, you know, so impressive as a leader. Whereas I, I spend my time with people with a lot less power, and when they confess to doing things wrong, everyone's like, "Well, yeah, whatever, big deal." <laughs> like, of course you do. But for some reason, when it's people with power who have abused and ultimately done more damage, we seem more eager to forgive them and and show our appreciation for their the honesty that they've shown that has been so painful. Uh, I, I think, yeah, this desperation to still want the people that we've trusted to be right is, is some really powerful stuff. Yeah. And it seems he wields that early. This is, and this is part of that confession strategy is this is the truth. People want to be true. Mm. Yeah. And there's yeah. a book called willful blindness by Margaret Heffernan. That's that mm. explains like our brains are wired to believe the truth we want. Yeah. And so it's a real gen, you have to work against your own inclination, your own brain activity to believe the narrative that is not as true as you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? That yeah. it's not the one you want. And the one you don't want, you don't want this guy to be an abuser. You want him to have had an affair and made a mistake and even maybe been overcome, you know, all the, we want that to be the true narrative because the yeah. other alternative is so kind of horrific. Yeah. And it, and it means admitting that we might have been, like say, might have been blind to something that was happening. And we don't want to, we don't want to think, we don't want to think that we're people who are taken in by people. And we don't want to think that, that we can be hoodwinked that way. 
Yeah. And so, like you say, everything in us wants to believe kind of the best thing. The sad thing about that is why do we not give the same sort of grace to a victim who comes forward? Mm -hmm. (laughs) If we want to believe that people tell the truth, we need to give the same weight to a victim statement. And frequently we don't. Like you say, James, because of the power that this person already has. Well, and then even, yeah. And even in that church, they just refused to read the statement from the victim until we did. You know, and so, and then the big criticism was, you know, how dare you use social media? And I was like, that's literally what Bruxy set up. Like, yeah, it wasn't us who started this. It was, you know what I mean? Like, but we're so highly criticized for that and not a word about, um, about this. And then there's kind of this acknowledgement of some spiritual leadership and Christian Mm -hmm. clergy, which again, I think he uses the word doubly accountable, which I think is fascinating. Just accountable, just once. <laughs> just one lot of accountability is fine. So even this idea of like the dynamics of power without recognizing that his voice is a solo voice being put out on a global yeah. platform, she's anonymous for her own safety yeah. uh, and protection, which it would turn out later was a really good idea because mm. <laughs> yeah. he was completely attacked by people who were defending Bruxy by virtue of Bruxy's blog. Like, you know, so even when there's been some charges and some police investigations now into even the culpability of like the church and Bruxy, like, you know, and Bruxy started like, well, I had nothing to do with any of that. And you're like, well, not really. Like this blog sets her up as yeah. this, like, you know, a fair, you know, this woman who's the mistress. Like, yeah, the mistress who now wants revenge because, you know, I don't, it, Yeah. I I also feel like this this paragraph, which involves dynamics of power and influence and expectation of exemplary conduct, I accept this responsibility. No, no, you don't. Because what I need to hear there is an acknowledgement of the pain that is caused when a spiritual leader uses their position to get a relationship or even just has a relationship with someone under their care. And that is not acknowledged anywhere in this whole thing. Yeah. So, so, so there isn't actually an acknowledgement, a response, a kind of acceptance of the responsibility. Um, It's not a side thing. And that frustrates me a lot about this. The the fact that you are the leader of a church is not a side issue to the other things that are going on here. It's a core issue to what is happening. And, and that responsibility isn't taken because again, what he does here is, is acknowledge his position. Mm-hmm. not the position of the woman who was in his care. Right. So we're back to centering himself again. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. And this is one of the, the features of the blog that is so um, kind of badly ingenious is that he now, this next paragraph paints the woman as brave mm-hmm. and courageous, says she had more courage than him, um, which really paints her as the stronger yeah. Again, this is a denial of the dynamics of power that are at play in this story. Yeah. And makes people say the sorts of things that we heard, right? How bad could it be if she didn't come forward? She's right. able to come forward now. How bad? Because the problem is for victims, like we're we're kind of stuffed from both sides, right? Like if we come forward, then we're strong. And so it can't have been that bad. And if we don't come forward, it can't have been that bad because we can come forward. Like mm. we can't win. Yeah. Right. Like, and and here, yeah, we she it sets her up as a kind of for that sort of criticism. Well, she's brave now, therefore she must be fine. So why can't I just be forgiven? Yeah, and also the courage and bravery again resets this narrative of equality. Like yeah. it denies the actual dynamics of control yeah. and manipulation and the power. Yeah. That was that, that making this thing a possibility. So it, it creates this like equitable. So that was like in her confession, she at least, at least just mentioned the age and the conditions by which the, the, the relationship started. So sort of like that last confession where, okay, wait a minute. I was young, like over 20 years, your junior, and I was yeah. in crisis and yeah. I went to you for help. That's how this started. And so then you could see anyone that knows anything about abuse and power dynamics or grooming mm-hmm. or anything went, wait a minute. 
That yeah. doesn't sound like what I imagined when I read this confession. Yeah. And he's not, you know, I, I know that. So I work for two churches and I basically don't do anything else because I haven't the energy. Chances are, and I'm single, right? So the chances are, if I'm going to meet someone, I'll probably meet them at work and that will be in church. So it's a side issue as long as it's all in the light, above board, clear. It's not someone I'm ministering to. It's not someone in crisis. It's not someone who's vulnerable. But it's not just a side issue. Like I have to think about it all the time. And he is kind of making it like, oh, by the way, at the time of this affair, I happened to be clergy. Right. No, <laughs> none of us happen to be clergy as well, right? Yes. <laughs> like we that take is... it seriously. None of well, us and just that was part of the. It. Yeah. And that was also, it was also playing into what was going to be announced. So that was part of the, our problems with what was going to be announced. Cause it was like, okay, yes, there was this again, relationship, which is not how anyone would define abuse. No. Um, so there was a sexual relationship, which we were like, Hey, that's not right. That's not exactly what that was. And then, uh, it was bad. <laughs> it's against all of our program. You're like, yeah. yes, hopefully. And then because he was a pastor, it's really, really bad. Yeah. And that's literally their statement. His confession is like literally like painting a way for this statement to have some sort of weight and be read yeah. through the lens of this was an extramarital affair. And it was really bad because he was a pastor, yeah. but he's really sorry. So can we move on? Yeah. And, it, yeah. I, I, and that's it, isn't it? Like those are not that's not the power dynamics and that's not the responsibility clergy have when when we decide to have any relationships with anyone <laughs> in any framework. It's not just sort of uh, a side thing. I also That's think so this annoying. idea of like repenting before God as though like he's already dealt with this. Yeah. But now realizes, you know, like that whole idea is also just sad. Again, there are points for me where he brings, he drops in theology quite subtly. And I think this is, again, when we, you know, if we we end up talking at some point about grooming and and how people manipulate I'm so, I've repented before God for most Protestants means that we have a theology of, well, I don't get to judge you. Sin is sin. Mm -hmm. It's all, you know, like I don't get to judge you if God says you're okay. So he's subtly saying, look, God says I'm okay. Yes. Mm. So who are you to now say I'm not? And, yes. and again, I don't think you don't, this isn't sort of like a stream of consciousness. This is highly crafted. And I do the same sorts of things if I'm crafting sermons, you know, like I drop theology in and then I later on I'm calling back to it. What he's saying here is I had repented before God. So it was OK that I carried on ministering. You know, let's read the silence here. It's OK that I carried on. It's OK that I did these things because God forgave me. Mm -hmm. But I do get that probably I need to ask you guys as well. Please forgive me. And then. And then again, it's our fault if we don't forgive. Right. It's right. our fault. I'm sure people have told you, Daniel, that you need to have more forgiveness mm. <laughs> and more. I get this yes. a lot, you know, but yes. this is kind of like now it's now again, it's not about him. It's about us. Yes. It's about my response. And I'm the bad guy if I don't go. Right. This is this whole you know setup, what? right? It's all part yeah. of the setup. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and that theological manipulation part is so connected to the way that a leader, like a clergy abuses people. So again, like to read this confession, like if you're a survivor to read this confession is really re-traumatizing because so much of the craftedness of this confession in terms of like, you're the strong one, I'm the victim, mm -hmm. um, please forgive me. I've repented, you know, like all this yeah. stuff is like part of how abuse works. These yes. uh, people uh, and across all kinds of, not just in this situation, but yeah. across all kinds, survivors have said like when they've expressed regret or when they express like this doesn't feel right, their abuser, because they're spiritually, you know, their leader will say, yeah, it doesn't feel right, but God, it is right. God says it's right. And look in the scriptures, there's these things and people are human. Yeah. And I need you. And God knows that I need you. And like, so this level of spiritual abuse that keeps people in these destructive, abusive relationships, yeah. we're kind of, we're viewing it here, but we're so <laughs> not aware of the dynamics yeah. of power in spiritually abusive relationships yeah. that we're not even seeing it. But when you see it, you're just like, oh my goodness, like he's, yeah. he's gaslighting us too. You know, like yeah. this whole thing is just another exercise of how abuse works. Yeah. I was looking at a few 
um, apologies in kind of preparation. And I wrote this note to myself that just said, asking for forgiveness in a Christian context is more manipulation. Mm-hmm. And the thing that's hard about that is I also am someone who believes in forgiveness and I believe that God forgives and I believe in repentance and I do believe, you know, like I'm not someone who doesn't, I'm not bitter and, and like, just doesn't believe in these things, but we cannot allow people to wield them right. as a, as a power tool in that right. way, you know, yes. and we do, we constantly let people get away with it because, because the moment they ask for forgiveness, we go, well, we've got to, we've got to forgive. but here's the problem with some apology like this is actually it's not on me to forgive Bruxy. It's about the victim Mm -hmm. and has he apologized to her and is she, she's the person who can forgive, you know, but instead he's put it out there (laughs) and now it's, and now it's us as the church congregation to do it. And that's how you see people that then going to bat for him on the internet. Yes. Because he's brought everybody into this and it's not, us that need to forgive and we don't have that power, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know? And also forgiveness is not again. And also this isn't even a genuine ask for forgiveness. It's a manipulative tool to get people to see him as a victim, but like genuine forgiveness is to admit the truth, you know, which is not happening here at all. Like he literally speaks a lie. I had an extramarital affair. That is not what this was. What he meant to say, if it was a confession was I abused, I sexually abused four yeah. people over the last 20 years of ministry at the meeting. Like that would have been maybe a, an authentic confession. Yeah. So this isn't even, so the idea of it being manipulative, it, it has to be that yeah. because there's no other, it's not the truth. Um, this last paragraph here, I think I just want to chat yeah. through is just how he so graciously submitted his resignation. Mm-hmm. Again, another power, like, look what I've done. This is evidence of how sorry I am. I've done something. They asked me, the meeting house asked me, and I submitted. Yeah. Again, one of these things that, like, he's a good guy. Look how good of a guy he is. He's submitting to this process. He's not Um, putting up a fight. He's just, he's going with, with righteous kind of, you know, yeah. Yeah. As (laughs) though also his resignation was something gracious. Like, Mm -hmm. Like I yeah. was actually shocked that he, that that was even a like the idea of submitting your resignation, being asked to submit your resignation over being fired for abusing people is just shocking to me. Yeah. But even this idea, like I had the power and I could have held it, but I gave it up. It's sort of this like, you know, illusion of goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I think in the in the center of all of this as well is it's worth remembering that ultimately uh, pastors are hopefully usually very effective communicators and they are good at ultimately now the problem is that can become manipulation that can become but ultimately when i preach i want you to feel a certain way and ideally what i want you to feel is that jesus loves you and there's nothing that you can do to change that and that's an amazing incredible wonderful thing but that's because hopefully I have been gifted with certain communication skills and i think one of the frustrations and upsets for so many of us is Yo, Bruxy was one of the most effective communicators in in Canada easily. I think one of the best communicators in the world. And so if it feels like we're wailing or going quite hard here, I do want to say it's difficult to give someone the benefit of the doubt when he had three months to craft this statement. He had three months to think through what he was going to say. And he's one of the most effective communicators out there. And so the fact that he said what he did means that everything there is deliberate. And so if it feels like, well, you know, you're reading the worst into that, we're really not. This is a deliberate thing. Yeah. And and that's a kind of a hurt and a frustration, I think, for for so many. Again, y'all are good communicators. That's why people want to listen, right? Like there's a reason. Well, it also (laughs) wasn't, it wasn't like a statement he crafted and sent to the church to share. Yeah. He did himself. Um, this was a calculated decision that he did to control the narrative, to get ahead of the victim statement. Yeah. Um, so like, there's a lot of, you know, things about it. I, I was actually thinking through, uh, Matt Chandler recently did a confession of nothing publicly. Uh, and again, that, that's a classic, like I'm confessing deep. It's just a deep, deep moment and basically says nothing he's confessing of. Uh, and then even what he does name is so nef- like everyone literally like, what does that mean? Nobody has a clue. There's no other side. There's no evidence. There's no transparency. It's just like, you go, you better believe me. 
But one of the things about that confession, which is really interesting, or, or just in keeping with these like debunking confessions, is this the the premise of the confession is very similar. This happens everywhere. Is like we're a church that believes that everybody is sinful. Like everybody yeah. is broken and everybody. And if, if you don't understand that even our leaders are broken, then you're probably in the wrong church kind of thing. And it's like yeah. setting up this premise that everybody has to agree that leaders are people too. And that we apply the same, you know, standards yeah. of like our temptations and stuff as we do to these leaders. And again, totally not recognizing power imbalances, yeah. totally not recognizing or even having information to make this kind of decision. So when you, when you have that information, okay, he's a person too. So we see that. So we're like, oh yeah, I can see like, this is a lot of pressure and this is hard yeah. and this is a hard job and this could happen to anyone. But of course we have no details of what yeah. happened. If we had detail again, back to this power dynamic. So you have the microphone, you have the platform. We have all this vested emotional energy in this relationship with you. Mm. We're used to believing what you say, because that's what we literally do every Sunday. And then you say this thing, but there's no counter to it. There's yeah. the victim has no voice. There's no transparency around what the dynamics of this relationship were or how it began or what the details were. So everybody's kind of just left with this one narrative. Yeah. And so what else do you, what else do we think people will do? Like, that's the other thing is like, as people were responding with this total like defense of Roxy and like, how dare you and all this stuff, I was like, well, of course, this is what you're going to mm. do. Cause you don't have any of the knowledge that is required yeah. for you to make it even an informed decision around what this really was. All you have is someone that you trust and love and has been maybe more responsible for your closeness to Jesus than anyone right. telling you a thing. Yes. So yep. believe, again, I hope when I speak on a Sunday morning, people believe what I say. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's yeah. really important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's really difficult, isn't it? Cause we, like I say, you, we don't want to be, bad at like you know people should be good communicators and we want our leaders and we also do want our leaders to be human i hope nobody thinks that because i'm up at the front i think i'm perfect mm -hmm. but this is not that That's exactly <laughs> this is right. sexual abuse yes. and and i think this kind of again a narrative of like all sin is sin mm -hmm. is like well that's fine in a theological context but in a practical context we have to deal with these things differently Mm -hmm. And we have to start taking responsibility for the fact that some things have bigger consequences, damage people more, are more destructive than other things. That doesn't undermine our theology. And the, the Matt Chandler, <laughs> I watched that. They preamble it. Mm -hmm. I mean, with about kind of five minutes mm -hmm. of God is great. We still believe God is great. We still like it's this massive warm up that just puts you in a place of going, I do, I do think that even when awful things happen, good can come out of it. Yeah. Which again, stops someone taking responsibility for the hurt that they've caused for the damage they've done, mm -hmm. because now we're putting it in a context of like, God works all things for good or something. And you're like, mm. no, like we, we need and to if stop. You can't that. see that good. Well, yeah, maybe you don't too. believe in right. God. Yeah. You know, yeah. like maybe you don't, maybe you don't understand enough. Maybe you, and it's not even, and sometimes, and again, like, like you said, James, like it looks like we're going really hard on this. I think sometimes we do it as Christians by accident. So we minimize by accident. And I think one of the things that, that we're all kind of calling for is for us to stop doing that. <laughs> Stop yes. it. Like, stop. Wait a moment. Don't do that. Don't theologize it away before we've had a chance to hear the pain and the hardship and the damage that was caused. You know, we need to stop doing the theology first. We need to live in the like in the like what has actually happened. And a good a good apology should acknowledge the power that is there. And should also acknowledge the harm that is done and should be clear about the harm that is done. And that's it, actually. I don't want you to ask for forgiveness. I don't want you to even particularly say sorry right now, mm -hmm. you know, because. Yeah, because, because actions need to hear what like happened. You Right. And, and again, even if you really are sorry, you'll recognize a power imbalance of. Yes centering your own narrative and like it's literally just doing this as evidence that you don't you're not really sorry because yeah. <laughs> you're doing more of the same yeah well i've been asked a few times when i when i've kind of been on a rant 
um, well, what do you want? <laughs> like, yes. What do you want? Like, what evidence do you want, Charlotte, that somebody has has got, you know, is be- is understands what they've done? And for me, if you truly understood the damage you have done by sexually abusing somebody, the evidence that you fully understood that is that you wouldn't ask for forgiveness. You would wait. <laughs> I don't think these men and there are women that abuse, but I don't think, you know, we're mainly looking at men that have put out apologies. The reason I don't think they understand or have come to terms with uh, the damage they've done is because they're already asking for forgiveness and reframing it. And if I truly, if I had damaged someone that much, I hope I would have the grace to step away and not ask, you know, I think that in itself is evidence that they don't, they either don't understand what they've done or they're trying to cover up what they've done. Those are the two options for me. Right. Right. If you set someone's house on fire, you're not going to continuously turn up on the hospital as they recover being like, why aren't you forgiving me? Why aren't you forgiving me? Why aren't you like, I'm yeah. still like recovering. Give it a moment. It's yeah. yeah. You know, like give it a, give it a minute before I we're supposed, you know, and with a someone in who is in clergy, they've we've you've also damaged relationships in the church and you've damaged relationships all over the place. Give people time. Give them that's time. That's one of the things that's most disturbing about this too is just this like, please forgive me to a whole group of people on social media, but like no actual genuine relationship forgiveness happening in private, yeah. which again is all part of this dynamic of yeah, I'm I'm different here than I am in real life and stuff. That's but. it. You know. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what uh, what we would so what we would say is if you are someone that needs to make a confession and you're a public figure and you have lots of power and you're a clergy person and you have a microphone or a platform or a blog, maybe don't do it so quick. <laughs> Number one, maybe do it legitimately. Yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. like actually say the truth when you're going to make a confession, especially if you're going to title it my confession. You might want to actually make it a confession and not yeah. just some yeah. sort of like weird manipulation and narrative setting and centering yourself. Um, and maybe it's less about you. Maybe it's about yeah. a healing process. Maybe it's about letting the process be what it is. Maybe it's, it's going to take some time and maybe it's not your place to speak when you've been speaking forever and not telling yeah. the truth. Uh, maybe that's yeah. not where you get to speak right now. And that's part of the discipline uh, maybe of listening and learning and um, your own repentance. Yeah. Uh, we're not against confession. I think it's a really great idea. I just think it needs to be um, done uh, in honesty. Yes. And a dishonest confession is much worse mm. than anything else you can imagine. I, th- I, I literally think this, yeah. uh, this specific confession we've debunked, uh, is literally responsible for so much vitriol yeah. hate and misunderstandings. And even still at the meeting house camps of people who are supporting Bruxy, even in light of these ongoing investigations that are clearly showing that this is not true, but this narrative is kind of cemented as a direct result of this, mm. this blog. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and nobody has said so, <laughs> which again is like another layer of like, let's just add, you know, more fuel to a fire that is going to keep on re-victimizing people over and over again. So yeah. let it stop. That's what we're saying. Let yeah. it stop. Let the truth be think- old, debunk the things that need to be debunked. Um, speak up. Like, again, this is like one of those other things where like, there's all these people who have not spoken up and said, actually, that's not true. Yeah. That blog's not true. I don't know if the church has asked Roxy to take it down. I hope they have. Uh, it is down now, but that's been mm. like just for a week. It's that's been up for that. almost a year Yeah. Uh, with nobody saying that is not true. And uh, yeah. it clearly being the case. And I think, so we started with that that confession inside of a church service and that channel has happened in a certain, and I would like to say, I think that's a bad forum <laughs> for someone to stand up and do a confession unless we as the ch- the other church leaders, like if that, I mean, you know, again, like kind of, I hope it never happens in a, in a church I'm in, but it, it may. I don't think doing that on a Sunday where you've just had worship and then you talk about some other theology is the way to frame it. Like we either well, and need- also it's a one-sided event. Of course, this person yeah. with Matt, we don't know who they are. They're nameless. 
their friend yes. is the person that had the issue, not the per, you know, I yeah. mean, there's so many like layers of removal from any sort yeah. of wrongdoing. So you have this dominant narrative being a dominant narrative still. So what's, yeah. what are you confessing? Literally nothing. You're just doing the same thing over and over really? again. And, and everybody yeah. is sat in a church service, quite vulnerable. We're there to hear from God. <laughs> We're there to worship yeah. So we're already primed to to just hear what we're being told. And yeah. that in itself is manipulation. So those of us who are supporting people who are making confessions, you know, who are who are setting up services, we need to think about that and just maybe maybe you don't do worship that day. Not yeah. because God doesn't need worshiping, but because let's be clear about how how we frame things. Yeah. And frame it as honestly and as cleanly as we can. Nothing's ever going to be purely objective, but let's let's us make some effort, yes. you know, when these things come out to frame them as cleanly and as honestly and as kind of it takes break, like boldness. But can, could we do that? Could we not surround it with all these other things? Because actually it's always going to hurt. So mm-hmm. maybe we have to be OK sit in it, take the hit. I think that's a good place to leave it. And, um, for those of you, you know, who've been tracking with us, um, we're sad. I mean, I'm sad that this is the case. I'm sad that this is what happened. I'm sad that it's been almost a year and nobody has actually publicly said that's not true. Um, I'm sad that this has actually caused further harm, uh, to victims. I'm sad that this has put like some weird narrative in the the heads of people who are now, you know, off on another tangent and it's going to cause more and more harm. I mean, we're super sad about this. I'm sad, you know, we're, we're kind of like doing our best to, Mm. to be as truthful about it and as talkative as we can, but be here inside of me. It's not just angst. I feel it's sadness Mm. that this continues and this, and so we want it to stop. So it's people as well. It's real people that are being really hurt. Uh, yeah. And over and over again, heard again and again and again by similar behaviors that just keep happening. So one of the things we're hoping in this podcast is there might be some revelation that you would go, wait, I am not going to just believe this. I am not, I am going to put my critical mind on with the Holy Spirit's help and ask for wisdom to say, no, actually, I'm not going to just believe one side of a story. I am not going to actually re-victimize people. I'm not going to believe a narrative I want to be true just because it's better for me. Um, I'm going to actually ask for something different and something more, um, not only from the perpetrators, but also from the institutions that have allowed them to operate for so long. Mm. So um, I don't know what that looks like in your own setting, but I do know that there is revelation happening and Mm. that God is helping us to see more clearly than ever before. And people, this is good news. Mm. I mean, this is the light. This is what we pray. When we say like, God, send your revival. This is what it looks like. It looks like this first. It looks like the light coming and freedom coming and clarity coming and wisdom on our way and like purity coming. And this is some of the ways that we do that. So Mm. we've debunked a couple of confessions here and there are many more, but now we'll leave you with the tools that you have to debunk them for yourself because I'm sure there's a lot more coming, but it's time to say no more to fake confessions. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charlotte, for being here. 